Boy, this is the time of year when we're all talking about joy. It seems like you can't go anywhere without hearing a song about joy. But for millions of Americans, they don't feel joyful. Uh, so joining us are two joy experts, uh, relationship experts, uh, Dr. Uh, Harville Hendricks and Dr. and Dr. Helen Kelly Hunt. Thank you so much for being on this show. Thank you for having us. We're glad to be here. Now glad you, st to be here. you started a process called Safe Conversations that helps people go from conflict to connections, and then you have a wonderful nonprofit called Relationships First. But let's start with joy, and and what steals our joy? Well, let me start first with why come we're interested in joy, and from our perspective, we think we're interested in joy because it's it's our nature. It's built into the genes of our being. It's built into every cell. And it's a, so therefore it comes with being, it comes with being human, it comes with being born, it comes with existing. And that's why we're interested in it is because we don't have it, we don't experience. And what we can say is you don't experience the joy that is yours, the joy that is your nature. And then the big question is how come? And in our work together in research on this, we've come to this conclusion that there are two basic sensations that we can experience. And one is the joy that runs through all the neural pathways of our body. And there's a second one called anxiety. And uh, those two sensations, they're sensations, not feelings, that cannot travel the same highway together. So when we experience anxiety, which is very common, any, anything can happen, a, a glance, a tone of voice, a look in the eye, um, acts of nature or whatever creates anxiety. Joy then shuts down and there's a psychoneural piece of that that shuts down and anxiety uh, uh, is turned on. And then we experience, that's too painful to experience. Anxiety is a terrible, terrible sensation. So we convert it into a feeling and the feeling is, well, resentment. I can be resentful because I'm not feeling uh, something going the way I want it to go. I can feel angry because something is not going the way I want to go. That feels better than anxiety. To be that scared is better to be angry. We also can get into regrets that things have not gone our way and we can look back over the years how bad it was. And, and then any other fears that come up, like uh, what's going to happen at dinner at Christmas, or people are going to talk and so forth. So that the joy that is our nature is ruptured by our, um, by the part of our nature that also uh, uh, helps us understand that uh, there are dangerous things in the world and that scares us and that switches on anxiety. Helen, what do you want to add? Well. Um, yes, the season of joy, we want to be on joy, but there are these joy stealers. <laughs> and what we say is there are four things to keep the joy in your holiday season. Uh, the first is we have a new definition of conflict. Uh, traditionally, we think if you're having a good relationships with a lot of people, but some you got conflict with, oh, you just wish they'd go away. They're just, if, you, if you'd you be happy in your life if they weren't there and you have to avoid them. Our definition of conflict, Jeff, is conflict is growth trying to happen. Mm. Something's trying to be transformed and if you hold the conflict right, it can be transformational for you and the other person. And so when you're having conflict with someone, number one, shift from judgment to curiosity about what's trying to happen here. Mm. And the way I say it, because I use faith language, I say maybe God's trying to show up and make something happen. So just hold it lightly. Number two is using the safe conversation process in your holidays. There's a dialogue process mm -hmm. where you when someone talks, the other person mirrors them. And what the 
the dialogue sentence stems does is take a person out of their lower crocodile brain to the wise owl brain. We talk about there's this reactive like, oh, I don't agree with that, or uh, why the heck did you say that? I, 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 only an idiot would say that. I mean, why do you vote for, how could you possibly, you know, cast your, you know, for shame, blame, and criticism. Mm. And uh, shift from, um, uh, the dialogue process helps you shift from the crocodile brain to the wise owl where you mirror uh, the other person and you you then, it helps you go to the part of the brain where you collaborate, you cooperate, and you feel better. You release different neurochemicals and it makes you a calmer person. Yes. And recently, we've never seen before the articles that have come out from the scientific community, Jeff, and we've known you a long time and we've never seen articles like this. Mm having healthy conversation releases norepinephrine, acetylcholine, you don't get sick as really? much and you live longer. Yep. It is now scientifically documented and we'd love to send you those articles. Yes. You're gonna be a happier, healthier person living a longer life. Number three is um, uh, taking a, what we call a zero negative negativity pledge zero negative well that sounds scary but what we say is uh, it's not what you say it's how you say it mm. and we can teach anyone to uh, bring up any issue in a way that's not negative yes and that then if it's not negative as you say it then the other person might you convert a frustration into a request and this is probably a good New Year's resolution, isn't it? To, to have a, a zero negativity pledge, at least for, for January, <laughs> to see how it works out. Yeah, and learn to ask for what yeah. you want using sender responsibility, yeah. which means you say it succinctly with a kind tone of voice and a kind look in your eye. Um, and then you're going to do number four. Well, um, just to uh, pick up on that uh, New Year's resolution about zero negativity and amplify that that's... Uh, that's really a good thought to begin thinking about that. Could also give it to each other as a Christmas present. Mm. <clears throat> that for Christmas we will refrain from being negative. And uh, I'd like to make a, a, another point and then come back to how actually damaging negativity is to our bodies, and to our minds, to our emotions, and to our psychology. It's not like a simple thing, cute thing, to not be negative. Um, so let's come back to that because the thing I'd like to mention as a fourth creator of joy um, is our discovery and the that of the research that's been done for now 75 years on relationship, and we have to say that the research has been um, as as we are careful to say that it's not just relationship; it's a healthy relationship. Then the question has arisen about, well, what is a healthy relationship? You would need something specific about that. And what we've discovered is that healthy means safe. It's safe for me to be in this relationship. And it's also important that I am certain that I am safe for you in our relationship. Yes. I'm safe for our children. I, and that means I'm not negative. Uh, which is what we were just talking about, what an important thing it is to pull that in. And, it, and that means that I, I have safe conversations uh, that are not judgmental. And conflict, uh, difference doesn't turn into conflict, it turns into creativity and co-creation. But you have to make safety the anchor point, or you can never experience joy. Joy and safety are uh, partners in the project. And there's a, a research project that was, came out of Harvard, <clears throat> a research that started in 1930, uh, in which um, a group of, I think there were about 200 people at Harvard went into a research project. So another parallel group at Boston University uh, went into a research project. I think at Boston it was African Americans, and at Harvard it was all white. 
So at the end of this project now, uh, the people who are reporting on this say that everyone in the group started off with prestige, status, and um, other kind and wealth. The question and, was, what gives meaning to life? Wow. And they okay. came up You've with these three things. You've gotten a degree from a prestigious yeah. university. What are you going to do with your degree? What gives meaning? Yes. And at the end of all of them, without exception, say, relationship, healthy, happy relationship with a significant other is the only ultimately durable, meaningful thing. So we now have, uh, and, not th and that's a kind of autobiographical or biographical research over from 1930 until now. We've had lots of other research in which the, the, uh, the, the factor, the core factor, has been relationship instead of it's about me and wealth and prestige and so forth. If I'm in a safe relationship, which is a healthy relationship, I'm going to thrive. But if the relationship is uh, unsafe or dangerous, I'm not going to thrive. I'm going to protect myself. Yes. I'm not going to experience joy because I'm, my anxiety is triggered, so I have to defend myself. But if I can be in a safe relationship, I can drop my defenses. don't have to protect myself all the time. And I can live in the joy that is my nature, which we think is the joy of being itself. And I think that's why Christmas is so important to everybody. And, and that they don't think about it. It's joy to the world, you know, the Lord has come, and all those kinds of things go on. It's like, why is that interesting to us? Why would we sing those songs? Why would we write those songs? And we think we do it because we're looking for ourselves. We're looking for that part of us, which is our true nature. And Christmas reminds us of that. And we usually are pretty kind to each other at Christmas, give each other gifts. We do all kinds of things to trigger that. But joy is our nature, so we can have it all the time. Christmas should be every day, and it will be every day if you're not scared and anxious. One of the things I love about your workshops is that you get real with the audience, and you mm -hmm. confess that there was a time when you two weren't happy. I and didn't know this was going to be brought up. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, but, yeah, we but, don't mind telling people. No, no yeah, I, I think, I think would it's you share that? I mean, I think, I think, I think it, it makes the audience understand that <clears throat> you're not just uh, living in ivory towers and not <laughs> experiencing this that stuff. We were. <laughs> Talk <laughs> about stealing the joy. joy I yes. mean, we. We love teaching this, but we didn't do it at home. Mm. And I would micromanage Harville. I would tell him, well, that's not good enough, and you're not doing this. And I was trying to improve him for his sake. Yes. It, 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 I, uh, and, I'm good at technical, good I'm proofing. good with technical assistance, but he was miserable. He didn't want to talk to me. He didn't want me to be in the room because I would go, Harville, your hair needs this, or you've got spinach between your teeth, or da da da. Well, someone else can tell him if he has spinach between his teeth. I found out that what Harville needed from me was not to know him and pay attention, micro, but not know him and mm. ask him questions. And I went, oh my goodness, okay, I gotta change and do that. And Harville would go, look, I teach this stuff, I don't do it. And so we didn't do it at home. And so we, we went to therapy. We were the smarter than all the other therapists that we went to, so we went to the divorce lawyers, and we announced to the world we were divorcing, and we added zero negativity, and that changed our relationship. Really? I'm in the marriage of my dreams. Yeah, I think and, that's wonderful. Yeah. And our family is now zero negative. Harville had been on Oprah 17 times. Our kids said, guess what? We're going to call Oprah and tell them, go on a show and tell the audience what y'all are really like. It was really a pretty, it was called the blended family from hell. So, but anyway, every relationship can get transformed. Which is wonderful. Would you do me a favor and can, during your workshops, you always demonstrate what, what a safe conversation looks like. And I think when, sure. when, we, when we talk about it, let's, can we demonstrate? Yeah, so it's now sure. a good time to talk about and demonstrate a safe conversation? Yes. Well, um, in, in um, my view, a safe conversation is my willingness to ask you, is now a good time? So that I don't mm -hmm. uh, sort of crowd into your world without your permission. So it's making an appointment. Let me see if I understood what you said, if I got it. Sure. Uh, that in your view, safe conversations is, it can begin with asking if now's a good time. Yeah. 
to talk to me about a certain subject because then uh, you're making sure I'm available. Did I get that right? You got it. Yep. And is there more about that? Well, well, the more is that if I ask you if you're available, then you can, uh, you can turn and pay attention. And then when I talk, you do what you just did. You mirror back accurately what I said rather than say something back to me from your mind. You mirror back what's going on in me expressed in my words. And so what you're pointing out is when you say, are you available, Helen, for me to talk to you about this, then I will either say yes or no. Yep. And if I say yes, you know that you have my total attention yep. and that I'm mirroring back your words to see if I was really listening. Yep. Did I get that? You got that. Okay. Is there more about that? Well, the more is that it's really, um, uh, what, what I experience when we do this and is that uh, it gets to be uh, to that thing we call safety that I can now talk because I know what you're going to do and which is that you're going to mirror me rather than criticize me or ta start talking about yourself. I, I can count on the fact that I can talk about me and you'll mirror me and then we'll take turns. Uh, so if I get it, uh, this is all about creating safety. Yep. And that you can count on the fact that you're sending a message to me and I'm not going to start talking back because I've agreed to listen to you right now. Yep. And now you're feeling safer in my presence. Yep. Feeling, I, okay. Yeah, feeling safer. And the safety is that I actually can predict what you're going to do next, which is one uh -huh. of the things we've discovered is necessary for safety. It, that I know that you're going to mirror me rather than talk about yourself or make a comment about what I said. You're simply going to mirror me back, my words back, my thoughts back. And that, and that makes it, <coughs> that's what makes it safe. So if I've got that, I would like you to know and Jeff Crowley to know I seldom hear you use that word predictability mm -hmm. when we talk, and yeah. that, that's making so much sense. You can predict if I'm going to interrupt you or talk back at you. No, when I say I'm yeah. available to listen to you, yeah. it makes me more predictable, and that increases the safety that you feel in my presence. Right. Am and I getting I that right? Gonna, I know you, if you said you're going to listen, I know that's what you're going to do, and you're going to mirror me back and not talk. So I okay. uh, don't have anything else <coughs> to say about that now. Well, uh, Jeff Creeley surprised us <laughs> by asking us to do this demo, <laughs> and this is enough. This was, uh, this was beautiful. This was yeah. beautiful, and, yeah. and, I'll, and I can vouch. Uh, yeah. I remember the first workshop I was at. It was a Valentine's workshop, and uh, you had just you were in the morning session, and uh, a, a young lady stood up with tears in her eyes saying mm -hmm. it was the first time she felt her husband had ever heard her. Yeah. Uh, and it's profound because I think so many times when, when a couple is arguing, uh, there is no listening going on. It's just you're thinking about what you're going to say next. Right. Well, and the, and the way we put it is that everybody's running their movie. Mm -hmm. And so you're running your movie and so you tell me what's going on in your movie and I just wait till you finish telling me what scene you're in and then I tell you what scene I'm in and that it and probably then can say my movie's better than yours or it's a clearer version of whatever's going on. So that's what produces that conflict we're talking about, which is totally unnecessary because if I listen to your movie, I get it, your movie makes sense to you, but it's not my movie and I don't have to judge it because it's not my movie. There are two movies yes, and they both make sense. And this is a, an amazing thing for all of us to get. Everybody in the world's different and they're running their own movie and all the movies make sense. That's really hard to believe, but it's true. And it's the only thing that can be because difference and diversity is also a part of nature. And if we accept that, then we don't have to go into trying to make it different yes. and kill it. We can go into exploring it, honoring it, enjoying it. And then we experience a different kind of joy because that's, yeah. 
So I want to get into the zero negativity and why that's so important, yeah. uh, Helen, because often when a couple is arguing, one or the other will take a cheap shot. And they will say something that causes the other one to shut down. Yes. Reminding them of something that happened 20 years ago. This is a common problem, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It, it is. And then guess what? Sometimes the next morning you go, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I, I didn't mean it. I mean, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have said that in that way. And, and this is what living in the lower brain is like. Things pop out of your mouth that you don't even mean to say when you get mad enough. And and then the next morning you go, oh, I flipped my lid. I went out of my mind. I just sort of went crazy for a little bit. I didn't mean it. And this is why, this is what it's like to live in the lower brain. We say, uh, the neuroscientists call it the reptilian brain. Yes. It's reactive. It says things... Uh, uh, reactively, it can't help itself, and and your and it thinks it. So your first thought is from the lower crocodile brain, but then if you use the sentence stems of dialogue, the sentences force you into the upper brain. You go, okay, now what am I supposed to say before I want to tell them what they really think? <laughs> yes. And it puts you in the upper brain, mm -hmm. and then you mirror from the upper brain. And then you're calmer. It's mm -hmm. a, it releases a completely different set of neurochemicals. The adrenaline and cortisone from the lower brain fight, flight, or freeze. Yes. But the acetylcholine, the norepinephrine, is about um, connecting and, and joy yes. and safety and wonder. And, oh, look at the wonder of life. And look at the awe around us. And if you want to live with joy and awe and wonder you live in the upper brain yes and one of the things that you did at the very beginning of that demonstration was very important I want to uh, put an explanation point on it was you made an appointment to talk about it yes I, I know for myself that often my wife will want to talk about something serious but she'll make it, she'll she'll bring it up at the very end of the day when I'm yes. tired and I'm yeah. likely yeah. to say something I really don't yeah. mean <laughs> uh, yes. would, would, I guess would be a better way to do it is when would be a good time to have a serious conversation yeah. or something yeah. your right. wife sounds like me yeah. for 20 years in our marriage I would yeah. always the phone wasn't ringing the kids were asleep I had his undivided attention okay Harwell here were the four things you did wrong today I was like bam <laughs> <laughs> it's just that doesn't work yeah so um, with the reason that we do the appointment uh, it, it is an appointment it's it's, um, it's honoring boundaries mm. and this is both important personally in a relationship is important globally. Whenever anybody crosses a boundary, you produce conflict. And so if you don't want conflict, don't cross anybody's boundary. But you can say to them, may I cross your boundary? Yes. And then they will say, well, I'll take down my rope or open my door and you can come into my space and now we can visit and exchange things. And it's that easy to do, but as Helen is saying, usually we're running from my needs or my anxiety or something, running from the lower brain, and we're not using prefrontal cortex stuff. But we say to couples and to everybody, it's very simple. Just ask people, are you available to talk about a, a topic that I would like to talk with you about? And give them a chance to say, I'm available or I'm not available. Like, like you're uh, at night, uh, if your partner would say, Jeff, uh, empathically, I know you're really tired, uh, but are you available for me to have five minutes of your time to tell you about something that happened today? And one, and, and so this is again predictability. Now you know that in five minutes, uh, you can say, I love you, and I'm, now we're gonna do whatever we do before we go to sleep. But if she says, can I talk? Your mind is not going to say, well, she just needs five minutes. Your mind's going to say, she's going to talk for a long time. I'm tired. So, and then you're all disturbed about that. So predictability, specificity, and boundaries make the relationship safe. And now when it's safe, you know, everything can happen. When it's not safe, only defenses will happen. I think one of the cool things about your workshops is you, uh, it's, it's, yes, there are tears and there's emotion there, but there's joy as well. Oh. Yes. And, and you have a, uh, an exercise that you do where people are actually <laughs> jumping up and down. And yeah. if you could explain yeah. that, yeah. why do you yeah. do that? 
You want to do it? Shall I do that? Well, we call it, um, in, in our workshops, we call it the positive flooding exercise. We found that many of our uh, people who've been trained uh, who have faith traditions call it the blessing exercise. And it uh, basically consists of your, your partner sits in a chair mm -hmm. and you walk around the chair for and for one minute you uh, say uh, what I love about your body. And you, do, you I like your nose, I like your chin, I like your shoulders and blah, blah, blah. And then you shift in a minute and say what I like about your traits. I like your kindness, your caring, your giving, your holding, and so forth. Then you go to behaviors. And the thing you did for me, that you took my dog to the vet, you brought me soup when I had a cold. And then after they've done that for three minutes, they stand in front of their partner and jump up and down as high as they can. At the top of their voice, they yell, I can't believe I'm married to, or if they're not married, I'm in a relationship with somebody as amazing and wonderful as you, and I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you and at the top of their voice and until they run out of breath. And the whole room yes. then moves. And so this joy thing that's our nature is triggered in everybody when they do that. So they experience joy. And we, what we've learned is we can teach you to re-experience joy in three minutes. Wow. But you'll have to push yourself into the exercise and then it'll happen. So I have a comment, but do you want to make a comment first? I do, no, I, I'm smiling because okay. even okay. you doing that okay. exercise in front of me made yeah. gave me joy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, yeah. It's my a, intensity it, triggered the uh, cells in yes. your body, so your neural system, and you began to experience the intensity. That's amazing that we can do that. <laughs> so Harville woke up one day. Uh, he, his genius is he simplifies a complex thing of how people talk. It's very murky. Uh, and uh, a psychiatrist told us after she came to one of our workshops in Dallas, she flew down from the University of Penn. She flew back, called us, we didn't know her. She said, for the first time, the relational sciences are teachable. Mm -hmm. You can teach people to have a healthy relationship. Uh, and it's never happened in the history of the world. Do, and it's because of the breakthroughs in the neurosciences. Um, so like no one knows how to have a good relationship and that's why thank you for you know interviewing us and trying to get the word out but what i want to say is because like i thought i was helping my marriage and my family by telling harville what he did wrong before going to sleep <laughs> or no is how i could how he could improve himself and but now harville goes when people are anxious they they don't want to be around each other. When there's safety, people will connect. So it's, he deals with the two words. Relationships need safety, because if there's anxiety, you're not really there. Fight, flight, or freeze. Any anxiety, uh, and like the neurosciences, anxiety and humor can't go through, through the same uh, brain thing at the same time. Yes. Um, so if you're having something humorous or something delightful, the anxiety goes away. So every night, I just want to say, do you know what I do? I give Harville three appreciations every night before every going night. to bed. Every, every night. night. That's it's, awesome. It's a rule. And, and I give her, th I have to get in on this, I give her three appreciations. He does. Too. And, and then we, do and we go to bed, and, it's, and then we can make an appointment if there's an issue. And suddenly they're not really issues because we have so many positives. We actually, um, yes, uh, we are both critical thinkers in the best sense of the word. Yes. But we don't know how to have fun. And we realized we needed to bring fun into our relationship and into our family. We didn't know how. Yes. But it we got Groucho Marx glasses, <laughs> we got joke books, we, and we took, and, and so, oh, so at the end of the year holidays, we recommend that as you start your holiday dinner, everyone go around and give each other an appreciation. Mm -hmm. I think that's so powerful. And in, in the few minutes we have left, one, one of the things that really impressed me when we first started working together was you talked about all of the problems in society that we're spending billions and billions of dollars on is happening downstream when, oh. when really it's the upstream yeah. that we should be looking at. Yeah, we should be looking upstream. Uh, and, and the thing we should be looking to do upstream is to help people connect safely. And we think the technology of safe conversation is one way to do that. And 
In fact, we are really have signed on to trying to teach this to the whole planet in what we are calling the project of creating a relational civilization. And we think a relational civilization is the next stage in human evolution because the stage we're in and have been in for the past uh, several thousand years has been about the self, about me. It's all about me, my relation to God. Back before psychology came along and psychology came along, it's, it's my relation to my inner world. And uh, 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 Western democracy came along and said, you know, you're autonomous, independent, self-sufficient. And, you know, we are now freed from the monarchy, so you're now free to pursue your own dreams. It was about me, about me, about me. And we've discovered it really isn't about me. It's about us. And when we realize we're in a context and we take care of the context, there's a paradox. It takes care of us. The other way doesn't work. If you take care of you at the expense of the context, then the context and you suffer the consequences of neglect. So we want to say Christmas is about recovering your being, your nature, your joy, but it's a communal thing. It's a relational thing. Joy is relational. You can't have it by yourself. Yes. You can only have it in relationship. And Helen, that's so important because as a society, we seem to be going more in the direction of self, self, mm -hmm. self. Yeah. I mean, we take selfies, we're, we, we're self-important. Mm -hmm. We do lose sight that mm -hmm. it's, it's about us and not me, mm -hmm. don't mm -hmm. we? Yes, and the civic conversation right now is so polarized. Yes. So um, what I, I think to summarize anything I would say is the importance of shifting um, a frustration into a wish, setting up time when the other person is available to handle any joy stealer, yes. and, and, and help the person take little baby steps toward uh, what they can do to make the relationship better. Um, and um, we, that, that whole thing of it's about us. Um, what you focus on is what you get yeah. when you're thinking about other people. Um, That's so important. Yeah, and it's hard to keep that in mind, but if you do, it's a terrifying thought that what I'm getting, which I don't like, is what I've focused on, namely my criticism of you, and I'm getting feedback from you that I don't want because you were told to do better if I criticize you. But we constellate in other people the way they show up for us by the way we look at them. So I want to say one other thing about that, Helen, with regard to how that creates memories. And what we, we, we're all into memories and sentimentality, but the important thing is every second our brains are recording uh, how, our, how our partner or other people are responding to us and then how in turn we respond. So memories are created by the way the, our input, and we then record the outcome. So we can decide what sort of feedback we want by the memories we create in other people's minds. And one of the ways to create those good memories is to say, you know, I like you, you're an amazing person. Thank you very much for that, or yes. gosh, that was smart. Instead of, ah, not very good, uh, and do, do, do the put downs and so forth. The brain's gonna remember whatever I do. And then when you come and see me next, your brain will look at me through those memories and anticipate that I will do it again. Wow. So we can control all that. And a last comment for anyone who's watching this and going, oh, I don't know if I can quite do this. <laughs> no, it's not what you say, it's how you, how say, you say it. it. Yes. You can bring up any of your issues with someone, but do it in a way which in which it increases the likelihood that they'll listen and change. And that takes learning about safety, creating safety, and it, but you don't sweep anything under the carpet, Jeff. Yes. You, 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 know, you have to be authentic in your relationship and Safe Conversation teaches you how to be authentic in a way that your partner will listen. And, and you'll have joy. And you have some um, amazing uh, events coming up early next year. How do people find out about that? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, uh, go to the website relationshipsfirst.org to see all the things that we do there in terms of training and preparation. Um, but in January, we're going to do a webinar. You want to talk about that with Rian? Well, Rian Eisler is an iconic 
feminist mm -hmm. who wrote The Chalice and the Blade in the 1980s and about the matriarchy that existed before the patriarchy yeah. and she's created a center for partnership studies cool yeah. and she has wanted us to be on so january 16th i think yeah and we'll teach her audience the safe conversation process and then uh we have workshops coming up uh, for couples a uh, place to go to find that is on that website and then in, uh, in March, we're going to do a global streaming event about March the 21st, and that'll be on the website as well. So if you want to know more about what is available, um, there's where to go, relationshipsfirst.org. That's awesome. Well, I'd, I'd love to give uh, you both a chance to have a, kind of a final uh, word or thought for the audience. Oh, okay. You want to go first? No. <laughs> can well, you go first? Yes, I, I can go first. Um, and say with um, confidence that if you will um, ask people during Christmas if it's okay to talk now, uh, and if you will use um, curiosity rather than criticism, i.e. zero negativity, commitment, and make a practice of giving people appreciations just spontaneously. Gosh, I appreciate that. You, you cleaned up the dishes, you cooked the dinner, you close the door, um, whatever. Uh, and the reason is it, it's a neurophysiological thing. The brain needs to know that it's safe. And when you're affirming the brain with an appreciation and there's no negativity, the brain then relaxes and it will then can activate that other neural pathway called joy. And you cannot have joy and negativity at the same time, not even possible. So if you want a great Christmas, make it a safe Christmas, and then you can experience your true nature, which is joy. I love it. Helen, anything to add? Yeah. Um, I just think I would say to anyone listening, don't ever give up, that it's never hopeless, because Harville's in my relationship, it felt hopeless, and he agreed, it's just hopeless. But uh, if you hang in there, uh, we're an example of two hopeless people. The relationship was so horrible, it was dead, and it came back to life, and it's so joyful. And we're gonna, we are gonna have the most joyful holiday, uh, and we just wish everyone in Dallas and in the Metroplex can have a joyful holiday, too. Well, thank you so much. This has been an, an amazing show. Thank and, you. and thank you for sharing your secrets with the world because I think we all need to rediscover that joy. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That's, That's it for now. We'll see you next time.